Jonathan Foster, and I'm standing in as lead officer to the committee. So, Councillor Jane Dowson, Chapel Allison Walk Councillor. Morning, everyone. Councillor Paul Truswell, Middleton and Belle Isle. Good morning, Councillor Morale Midgley, Kipax and Matthew Ward. Good morning, uh, Councillor Gower Almas from the Beeson and Holbeck Ward. Mark Mills, Head of Asset Management. Angela Barnacle, Chief Officer for Asset Management and Regeneration. Morning, everybody. Rebecca Roberts, Legal Officer. Sarah Blenkin, Legal Services. Sandu Gattare, Information Governance. Morning, Mariana Pexton, soon to be Director of Resources. Louise Ivans, Principal Audit Manager. Good morning, Louise Booth, Head of Internal Audit. Angela Laycock, Principal Audit Manager. Morning, Mary Hasnip, Head of Finance in Corporate Financial Management. Good morning, Rich Dellis, Deputy Chief Officer, Financial Services. Morning, Chair, morning, Members, Gareth Mills, Grant Thornton, External Audit. Morning, Chris Horton, Grant Thornton, IT Services. Good morning, Linda Wilde, Independent Member. Rita Harron, Member for Aldi. Uh, good morning, Billy Flynn, uh, Battle of Wharfdale. Do you apologise for me a few minutes late? Good morning, I'm Debbie Oldham from Governance Services, and I'm Clark to the committee. Thank you. And uh, John Ellingworth from Kirkstall Ward, Councillor. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, moving to item agenda number one. Thank you, Chair. Under agenda item one, there are no appeals against the refusal of inspection of documents. Under agenda item two, there are no exempt items. Agenda item three, there are no late items. Agenda item four, could I ask members to declare any interests? And I take silence as there are none. Agenda item five, apologies have been received from Councillor Downs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So uh, moving on to uh, the minutes of the last meeting held on the 6th of February. Um, so just to do, 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 where am I? I've lost myself now, that always helps. Uh, are there any, are these a correct record of the previous meeting? I'll take silence as a yes. Moving. Are there any matters arising from the minutes? Yep. A few to run through here, so please bear with me. So, minute 63, the annual information governance report. Um, there were queries around target risk ratings, uh, review of benchmarking stats on FOIs and SAR requests, and also the number of times that the information governance services had to refuse to respond to information requests because that information is already public available. Now, I do believe that um, a uh, note has been circulated to members on that by the Head of Information Management and Governance. Moving on to minute 64, that was the update report uh, on the information and digital service. So members asked for details of the opportunities that are there for member democratic scrutiny of major system failure reports. Now, the Deputy Chief uh, Digital Information Officer has advised that he's checked that uh, with the Intelligence and Policy Manager and we advised that reports containing assurances on major system risks do go to the corporate leadership team and then they are reported through to members through the annual risk report to the executive board. Uh, there was also a question on how the information and digital service are ensuring the prioritisation of ICT projects and that they're aligned with member priorities so that there's again appropriate democratic oversight there. Uh, so I've been advised there that the service is currently in the process of putting together that prioritised list of the IT projects. This is something that's been requested as well by the, the Labour re Review Group, and it's currently being produced. Minute 65, so that was the internal audit update report. Uh, so I think there were various suggestions there around um, matters that can be included within the, uh, the sequence of plan and update reports that we give. So that's something that you will see coming through. Uh, there was also a briefing note that we circulated reaffirming the timescales outlined in our data analytics strategy. So ultimately, what we're saying there is that those timescales are appropriate to enable us to, to embed a solid foundation at each stage of that strategy. And that's kind of irrespective of, of our resource level. So hopefully that gives the assurance there. 
minute 66, I think there was a query around agency and IR35 costs. Um, that's been responded to by the Deputy Chief Officer. And a further question, I think, has come back from Councillor Dowson over the weekend, and that's being looked at. Uh, finally, minute 67, the annual assurance reports in relation to employment policies and employee conduct. So further assurances were sought there in respect of performance management. Now, I believe that's subject to a scrutiny inquiry with a report due this month. Um, so there'll be an opportunity to see what's covered there. Thank you for that. Do members have any other further matters arising? There we go. Uh, on minute 64, it does still seem an unduly tortuous route we have to go through, but what is actually quite a serious risk, um, you know, we bring it to scrutiny. But if it was automatic on our agenda, it would be, be better so that you're not, not miss things. And, and that, that's really the, the comment I wanted to make. Councillor Flynn. Uh, and... Yeah. Thanks, Chair. It was just to confirm under item 66 that the 2021 accounts were signed off on the 17th of February, so they're now complete. Thanks, Chair. Any other matters arising? Okay, so moving on to uh, item number eight, the internal audit plan 2023 to 2024. Morning. Um, this report presents our proposed plan for 23-24. It, the report runs through the process we go through to develop the plan, including the legal and regu regulatory framework. Um, we have a well-established process for developing the plan, which includes reviewing risk registers, consulting with officers within the council, including the Section 151 officer, the monitoring officer and senior management, as well as consulting with the committee themselves. Uh, we also have regular dialogue with colleagues in core cities and within South and West Yorkshire to ensure that we are aware of emerging risks within other councils. And we also undertake horizon scanning through training and events and key publications, such as the Institute of Internal Auditors Risk in Focus report, which highlights the main areas of concern for audit professionals. Um, we start the year with a small drop in resources. Um, the service is currently undergoing a restructure, which will change the profile of the grades across the team to align with other areas within financial services and to reflect the increasing complexity of the work that's being carried out by the team. We anticipate that the number of FTE within the team will increase through the restructure as we recruit into vacant posts. The drop in resources is reflected in a decrease in the number of days allocated in the plan as we've taken a prudent approach on the assumptions around the top down recruitment to the new structure. In undertaking the calculation, we've balanced the need to allow time for ongoing professional development of our staff and their well-being, uh, along with the importance of maximising the resource that can be devoted towards core assurance and consultancy activities. The two main focus areas in the plan this year are financial challenge and transformation. These reflect what we perceive to be the main areas of risk for the authority in the coming year. Linked to that, we've kept the time for ICT and information governance the same as last year to recognise the fact that a lot of the financial challenge and transformation work is predicated on delivering digital solutions. The council values remain an area of focus. We'll be building on our work that we've done recently on organisational culture through undertaking specific reviews within a sample of service areas. And each piece of work provides the opportunity to reflect on the extent to which the values are embedded within the areas of review. We will report any significant updates to the plan during the year through our update reports, along with progress in delivering the plan. We will measure success in delivering the plan through recommendation tracking, which we will continue to embed uh, across the council. Feedback from audit clients through our customer service questionnaire, which we are reviewing at the moment, and delivery of the plan through time spent. We'll continue to review these measures throughout the year to ensure relevant performance and information is reported to the committee. Um, any questions? Open up to members for questions then. Yeah. Yes, please, Chair. On page 29, uh, internal audit and ICT, the first item on page 29 refers to privileged user follow up. Um, who are the privileged users and how do you get on the list and how do you get off the list and 
have you chair seen this list? Because it's not, I'd like to see that. If I were you, I'd like to see that list. Who are privileged users? I've not seen that list, but I'll, I'll pass it over to officers. <laughs> Uh, privileged users are generally members of the uh, integrated digital service, um, and what it means is they have uh, increased enhanced privileges within the infrastructure rather than related to specific applications. Um, there is a process in place within the directorate to grant that only to people who need it. Um, and also for time limited, um, for, for a limited period of time so that um, it's controlled and that people don't have access when they don't require it. Um, in terms of a list, I don't currently have that, but I believe we could probably get one for committee if they would like it. Just as a quick follow on for me that in terms of ensuring that that access it doesn't last longer than it should be. Is it something that has a, an automatic kind of sunset clause where it shuts itself down or is that a manual process that someone double checks? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can find out. I do believe it is for a specific period of time, in which case it will turn itself off, but I would need to go back and double check that for you. you, don't, you don't. I don't know how many there are on the list now, please. Sorry. Again, I'd have to check that and, and get back to you on that um, because it's not it's only granted as required. So it's not something where there's people permanently on that list. Uh, but we can we, I can get information for you as to who is on that list. There's who's on it and how many are on it. I think it's probably reasonable that the chair just sees the list who's on it. I don't have a problem with that. But I think we'd all like to know how many there are. Is it 10, 50, 100, 200? Perhaps you'd let us know the figure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, page 28, and it's table two, um, whistleblowing hotline and reactive work. Uh, I, I, I know that this is um, projected plan for 23-24, but um, I, I'd like a little bit more information than we've had in the past about the, the results of um, any issues referred by whistleblowers, not just in terms of the outcome, but what the outcome was so far as the whistleblower was concerned, you know, what was the whistleblower happy with the, the outcome? If not, why not? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I think I was given a list of the uh, number of cases last year that came up, but it didn't really tell me anything about the, uh, the sort of satisfaction or otherwise of the person who actually reported the issue in the first place. Um, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, it it's a difficult one to answer because the whistleblowing hotline, we do get so many anonymous whistleblowing referrals, so you can't actually get feedback from those that are anonymous. Um, but the ones that we have received, we can ask those people if, if, you, if that's what you'd like. It would be possible to sort of separate out the ones that are anonymous. I, I fully understand the, the reasons why you can't follow those up. Um, with the ones that are actually given with a person's contact details in confidence, obviously. Um, but I would like to know, you know, what the reaction of the whistleblower actually was to the information that they gave. We will endeavour to do that. But like I say, with them, we do need to be careful around the sensitivities of what they're actually whistleblowing with, because um, they may see that as a threat, but we can ask the questions. We can ask the question. Uh, I, I, I understand the sensitivity sort of issues, but um, there is nothing more sensitive than a whistleblower coming forward and giving information. And by and large, uh, in my experience, it's the whistleblower who gets the rough end of the stick rather than the person to whom um, they've made the complaint about. Um, so it's it's from that angle. I want to make sure that the whistleblower is, is absolutely protected. Um, and surely the information can be anonymized. We don't have to go into details in open forum about a whistleblowing sort of issue, but we can have a, a closed uh, session surely with uh, uh, no records kept, etc. I, I think if I can just interject at this point, I think there's a difference between knowing that the whistleblower is satisfied and knowing the specifics. And I think there's a fair conversation about knowing whether or not the person that's whistleblowed is confident that their concerns have been taken on board without 
because at the same time as I get your point, maybe we can have a confidential session. Actually, we want to reassure the public that we take whistleblowing confidential uh, seriously without necessarily giving details. So I think perhaps if we have some form of assurance around actually those who have will have been willing to come forward, are they satisfied with how the process has worked? Are they satisfied that the cons that they were considered their considerations were taken on board? And are they satisfied that there actually there's been no repercussions for them to give the committee assurance that the process is working without getting into the really difficult process of anonymizing and releasing information that we may not intentionally want to release because they're quite sensitive? W would that be satisfactory, Councillor? In a word, no. Um I I I want to know, I want to know whether the whistleblower was satisfied. Yeah, you know, no, no. based and and I need to know not that I'll be given assurances by anybody. Um, that's that's the road to damnation. I, I want to know what the whistleblower actually felt about it. So that's the point I've just said that we actually need to get some reassurance, sorry, councillor, on whether the whistleblower was happy without necessarily delving into the detail. The last thing I, I think we need to do is basically be potentially bringing sensitive cases before committee members whose details we don't necessarily need. What we're here to is understand the assurance, not necessarily interrogate the process. Yeah. Can I also add, um, we need to be careful that we don't want to put people off whistleblowing. The danger is if we start asking too many questions and asking them to come forward, it may prevent them from whistleblowing in the future. So we will ask the question, but we can't force them to give an answer. Absolutely understand uh, all of that, but uh, that there is nothing worse for a whistleblower than basically to be ignored or to be penalised. As a result, of, we've had this conversation before, I know, and I have a lot of experience of what happens to whistleblowers, and it's not very nice. Um, I, I, whatever the assurances we get, I want to know personally whether or not the whistleblower is satisfied that the correct procedure has been followed through. Whether or not it was the result that they wanted is another matter. Uh, what I want to know is, is whether or not the complaint was justified uh, and what was done about it and whether the whistleblower felt that their concerns had been addressed. Okay, I think it's the whistleblower who's the most important uh, person in all of this yeah, I think we're actually saying the same thing, just probably in slightly different language. So we, we, we'll work with officers to get that done. Uh, any other questions? Councillor Trusswell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just following on briefly from, from Billy's point, I think there are ways and means of asking questions in a non-threatening way and leaving it to the discretion of the person to whom you're asking the question. They may not wish to engage, but they might see it as a further opportunity yeah. to improve the quality of how we deal with these things. I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions, Chair, around uh, Table 1 on page 24. Um, I note that we're no longer devote, devoting any audit time to what we've termed COVID response. Is that because we've pursued issues like irregularities around grants as far as we possibly can, and that those have now been, where appropriate, referred to government agencies? Um, my second question is around finance and key financial systems. We're reducing the amount of time devoted to those. And yet this is a constant theme of our discussions as a committee. And in fact, we've raised some of this. And I note that in the Grant Thornton report, which is a later item on the agenda, there are references to shortcomings in those processes. And obviously can talk about those in more detail at that point. And also um, the reduction in the amount of resource being devoted to procurement. Now, I do appreciate it, you can't continue to devote the same resources year on year to every aspect of it. But procurement, again, is another element of our oversight as a committee, which I think has exercised members at almost every meeting in some way shape or form and it's it's not just the mechanics and ensuring that we're getting value for money but we've kind of pushed the boat out a bit further into the realms of social value obviously we want our providers as far as possible to meet some of our climate uh, emergency priorities so i just wonder whether this is enough to ensure that's happening or are we confident that the officers responsible for procurement are now undertaking a robust approach to those particular aspects and my last question which you'd be pleased to hear uh, emanates from page 29 and it relates to dpias which data protection impact assessments 
Could the officers remind us why there was a limited opinion um, on that particular issue? I mean, obviously, as ward members or as a ward member, I'm conscious that we have to do DPIAs on things like the location of CCTV cameras mm -hmm. to combat antisocial behaviour or whatever on a permanent or, or limited basis. So I'd just be interested to, to get a little bit more information. I'm sure it's been reported here, but obviously, you know, I'm an ageing, atrophying mind. Uh, I've lost track of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. In terms of the COVID response and the business grant fraud, we have got to the end of the process with those now, but if there were any new or additional um, queries arising, that, that will be included in the anti-fraud and corruption block of time. I'll be able to give a final update on that as part of the annual report as well. Thank you. Um, in terms of the finance and key financial systems time. That's time specifically set aside um, for work within those pots. There's a number of audits throughout the rest of the plan, which cover a financial aspect. In fact, I think about 72% of the plan has some kind of finance attached to it. And as well, um, the procurement time, although it has decreased, there will be elements of procurement and a lot of the transformation work that's happening. Um, the, where they are looking at um, awarding contracts or getting suppliers, we will generally have a look at that process anyway. So we will get other assurance uh, through those as well as the work specifically within the area of procurement. Um, in relation to the DPIAs, the limited opinion was around the fact that the processes within uh, the Information Governance Department at the time uh, didn't allow us to have confidence that we had completed all the required DPIAs that we needed to complete and that they'd all been signed off. Um, the service is currently looking at that process, um, reviewing that process. So the piece of work that we've got in for next year is to go in and look at the new process and make sure it's embedded to provide that level of assurance that we have got all the DPIAs that we do require. Any other questions or comment? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of general ones from me, if I may. Um, on page 23, paragraph 3.2, you refer to um, looking to draw on a multitude of other work streams to help deliver the annual opinion, including an increased focus on consultancy work and client liaison activities. Could you just explain to me what you mean by how, well, how can we... How can you use consultancy work to inform your opinion? Um, that might just, just be me being a bit dumb. Um, so if you can help me out with that. And, and, and am I right in assuming that that's work done by yourselves or by other assurance providers? So within that um, consultancy area of work, we're including working alongside project boards, you know, the, the other audit work that we bring to audit committee as part of the update reports. Um, sometimes we um, we do map out the, where we get our assurances for. So say, for example, if Ofsted come in, we do bring their assurances in. So it is from a multitude of different areas. Thank you. So one would like to assume that the work that's done by Ofsted, for example, is of a satisfactory quality that you can place reliance upon. But are you confident that all of the other assurance providers that you take assurance from, if you like, for your opinion, that you're satisfied with the quality and the output of their work? We'd only take assurances from those um, that we deem to be reputable. I'll just have one more, sorry. Thank you. Um, my, my second and last question is, um, again, a, ge a general question, and it does link back to the advisory element that we've just talked about. So um, quite a few references in your plan to providing support and challenge. And I know we've said before that that's good. It's good practice to, 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 be, to be in that space. But how do you ensure that you're not then coming back later down the line and marking your own homework um, for advice that you've given at a point in time and then you're providing assurance on it later? And, and linked to that, is do you put a limit on, on the amount of time in your plan that you will put to advisory 
I don't know, I, I see some audit committees that say no more than, say, 20% of their annual plan will be made up of advisory time. Is that something that you consider? Yes, we do consider it, but we don't we don't actually give advice. We the the advice we give is to like explore the options. Have they considered X, Y, and Z? Have they provided the right challenge? Um so and also we are never the decision maker in any of this process. We we also do some work like Angela's currently doing some work on the core business transformation where we provide an assurance report um every quarter so it is giving like mini audit feedback on on particular processes like the um as a procurement of the transformation partner for example so there are mini deliverables within within some of this work we do but it depends on the scale of the project that that we're working alongside Okay, that's helpful. So long as it's not advice that you're giving and then going back and doing assurance on that advice later, that's helpful. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, uh, just bear in mind the fire alarm's going to go off in about 40 seconds. I'll be brief, thank you. On base 38, uh, Priority Awards and Homelessness uh, Designation HRA, uh, you've out outlined the um, overview of assurance and uh, assurance themes. Um, in terms of the risks, it just says various. Um, could you please um, sort of outline what a uh, couple of, um, if you like, major risks to, to this, please, uh, to the audit area? Thank you. Um, there'll be a number of risks around that. Part of it will be um, in relation to safeguarding, um, because part of the decision making process is, a, is about making sure that um, it, where people may be statutorily homeless that we've identified that and we're doing what we can just to let help you know those. the fire alarm's about to go so you might want to hold off on the, on the answers you don't have to repeat yourself should be going now There you go. <laughs> um, and as, uh, there will be an element of um, risk around the budget as well, um, because we will be taking time to do those awards and to uh, there'll be officer time involved in uh, any challenge to those awards as um, every person who um, gets assessed does have a right to challenge that so it's about making sure that the processes are there to make sure that the decisions are robust so that that challenge doesn't happen or when it does it, it's not a long protracted process that results in um, ombudsman and also there'll be information governance because of the sensitivity of a lot of the data that will be looked at in relation to the people that they're assessing Hello, councillor. Any other questions or comments? No. So moving to the recommendation then. Uh, the corporate does the corporate do we the corporate governance and order committee I can't even speak for one of the days. The, does the corporate governance and order committee uh, is asked to review and approve the pr proposed internal audit plan for 2023-2024? I'll take silence as we approve it. There we go. And I clearly need to have more coffee because apparently I can't read. Right. Uh, moving on to the statement of internal control in relation to estate management. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just introduce my colleagues who have joined us as well. Richard Jackson, who's, who's Head of Facilities Management, and Polly Cook, who's Chief Officer for Sustainability, Sustainability even, um, Environment and Air Quality. Um, so this report covers the um, the control around our estate management, which is um, as a as a landowner in Leeds, it is significant. We have over seven hundred operational properties and over nine thousand hectares of land. Um, we're the largest in terms of geographical area of the core cities, um, which means we do have an expansive estate. My colleague Mark is going to take us through the report in detail, um, but before he does, it's worth noting the exclusions that this doesn't um, include any property is managed under the housing revenue account, nor the school estate, nor the highways, which are covered 
under different parts of the legislation. Mark. Thank you. Um, so it, the, the first thing to probably just note is that in 2020-21, there was a review of estate management functions. And through that process, um, the, the, we, we found that there was a, a number of um, activities being undertaken in different parts of the organisation around estate management. So um, as a result of the review, um, the, the, the decision was taken to, to bring um, those people and, and those functions that were sat elsewhere in the, the organisation, either into asset management, facilities management or um, sustainable energy and air quality to um, ensure that we've got some very clear um, decision making and um, I, I suppose assurance around the work that was being undertaken. So, so that really reinforced the um, roles and responsibilities um, the, uh, around um, the estate management functions. And, and they are set out on um, page uh, three of the, I'm sorry, I, I'm looking at my version it, it's the third page of the the report um and and in, in there it um identifies the different roles of the the three elements of estate management i'll just quickly summarize in terms of asset management that's around the strategic planning of the estate um the the leasing and disposal of properties um and providing the land record services which many members might might have already drawn on um that as a resource to understand who is managing different parts of our portfolio um, facilities management um, delivers um, the, the management of our civic buildings, um, including security in front of house, but also delivers the um, staff street um, and cyclical maintenance um, of the operational estate. And then um, Polly's team, in terms of sustainable energy and air quality, um, delivers the decarbonisation works um, again to our um, to, to our estate, but also um, is undertaking the um, planned maintenance program. Um, and and the um, purpose of that being sat with decarbonisation is to ensure that a, a holistic approach is taken to looking at um, improvements to our um, properties. Um, not just looking at, at maintenance issues, but looking at how we can better those properties from a sustainability perspective. Um, it's worth probably just um, me setting out in the first instance the um, governance that we have um, around um, the estate. Um, so we have a um, corporate estate, estate management board which um, oversees um, the, 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 the um, estate and um, it's a non-decision making board, but it provides support and assurance um, to, to matters. Um, and it's chaired by the Chief Asset Management and Re Regeneration Officer, um, shared with um, the other chief officers um, from the estate management um, world. Um, and and um, that meets on a monthly basis. Um, underneath that, there's an estate management group, which is um, a, 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 an officer-led group um, chaired by myself um, in my role as head of asset management. And that's about bringing together um, and understanding the, um, the any issues that are facing individual directorates and services, but also allowing us to have a, a com combined, comprehensive and coordinated approach to our um, estate um, management um, approach and also the, the way in which we are um, responding to requests and, um, and, and work that's being asked for from um, different directors. And that reports directly into the estate management group, it's at the estate management board itself. Um, sitting within each directorate, we then have an um, estate or an asset management group, and that is chaired by someone, um, in, in most cases, a chief officer within each directorate and has support from um, the, the, the estate management teams. And that is the, the, the key opportunity for um, the services within each directorate to be able to set out any um, issues they're having with the, the estate they occupy, any changes that they may need to, to see as a result of service delivery changes, um, any 
um, early heads up about um, changes or, or the release of property from their um, management. And it just allows us to, to, on a more proactive basis, be able to um, support the directorates and service delivery, but also have early visibility of any changes that, that need to be made. Um, and that really does help from a, a, a strategic estate planning perspective, but it also helps from um, Richards and Polly's teams to, to understand where they're likely to have pressures for from an operational perspective or for, from an investment need. Um, I thought it was useful just setting out that that governance before I go into the the detail of um, how the estate is is planned and managed and um, the 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 oversight or the strategic um, policy um, direction um, around that. So um, in two thousand and one, um, there was a, a, a new estate management strategy which was um, approved by executive board um, in November twenty twenty one. Um, that um, was brought together with input from each of those directorate asset management groups and also estate management group, and then obviously the oversight of um, corporate estate management board. And that was really key in terms of um, ensuring that we had um, buy-in and the, the, the strategy was reflective of um, the, the um, direction of travel within each directorate but it all, and, and that actually there, there was um broad support for for the 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 way in which the estate was going to be managed moving forward so that document um really set out the um the sort of some really really clear guiding principles about how we would plan our estate how we would release properties um or make decisions about how how we might change our estate in the future and the fact that that needs to support service delivery, but also the growth of the city, um, whilst also having a, a really um, clear focus on um, reducing our liabilities um, and ensuring that we focus on our best best quality buildings and and um, and um, like I say, reduce that um, the the, uh, the the poor quality buildings that we have in the estate, um, but also recognizing that we needed to right size the estate clearly. Um, following the pandemic, we've been on a, a journey of asset rationalisation now for um, uh, over 10 years. Um, the pandemic um, further led to us having to really review our estate requirements, and that was the purpose of the estate management strategy to set out in um, a post-COVID world what that might mean. And clearly the pandemic had seen um, substantial changes in the way that staff were working um, and utilising um, our buildings, but also the way in which services were delivered with um, new channels opening up, such, such as digitisation um, in some cases. And that um, led to different um, approaches or needs for, for services within our buildings. So um, it, the, the, the estate management strategy is a really clear guiding um, strategy and document um, the, the, the report itself or the appendix to the report then sets out some other um, reports um, and the, the, the guide our um, decisions around the estate. First of all, we have the annual capital receipt program report, which goes to our executive board, um, and that sets out um, our disposal strategy and also the, the properties that are included within the capital receipt program. There's the climate emergency and annual report, which um, Polly leads on, and that sets out um, the interventions around how our estate, not just buildings, um, it, it clearly focuses on how how our buildings um, can can be um, improved in terms of their sustainability. But it also sets out uh, around um, how we may look at some some of our wider estate, so our land holdings, and how that can support decarbonisation, energy production, etc. And then um, there's the annual capital programme report, which um, is um, something that, that is brought forward from um, by finance colleagues. But within that, that sets out where we, we are um, going to see investment into our um, estate, um, but also reads across to um, our disposal strategy and, and clearly the, the generation of funds to support that capital programme. Um, in terms of um, the the way in which we um, ensure that we embed 
um, the principles of, of um, the estate management. Um, as I say, that is very much a, a bottom-up approach as well as top-down. Um, working through the um, estate management or asset management groups within each directorate, um, we um, have, have also taken the opportunity on the back of um, the, uh, the the, the um, approval of the estate management strategy to review our online presence through the council's intranet pages and um, and the internet pages themselves um, to um, more clearly set out um, how we will make decisions around our estate. Um, I think it's probably worth noting that we um, still acknowledge that we're probably not quite there in terms of the routes that, that inquiries can come through. So um, certainly we, we, we are aware that because of the different functions and different um, the, um, governance um, legislative and financial requirements around different parts of the wider estate. So in terms of um, the housing revenue account land, the schools um, and highways assets, that sometimes it's not entirely clear where where to go. Um, so again, you know, learning from that, we are going to um, have a further concerted effort and and try and make clear that the the um, the, the land records inquiry um, point is probably the first point of contact, and from there it, we we can then determine which part of the 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 organisation is then responsible for 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 the asset that that relates to the inquiry, and ensure that that you that members members of the public can get a, a response um, without necessarily going around various departments. Um, so, so clearly, that is lessons that we're learning through through the process that we that that we've got. Um, it's probably also um, worth noting that um, we, again, directorates are still on a journey of of um, learning and understanding and embedding um, the the approach. Um, and and that's just through many many years of the the organisation change uh, changing direction slightly, um, but also historic um ownership vesting of um assets within certain directorates um and so i think through the governance pro process that we've now got in place um we are starting to be able to define those asks and ensure that the, there's a, a broader um understanding of where the decisions need to be taken i.e within the services um that, that oversee estate management rather than within directorates themselves um I think it, it's also probably worth us noting that um we are on a journey with our information systems. Um the the systems that we've got in place are quite dated um and they um they, they certainly don't allow us to be able to quickly um pick up information um and, and, and have um the, the detail to hand. And we've been working with colleagues um in ids for, for um a couple of years now to try and scope out um what the new system would look like um there's um systems on the market that that will be able to do this work for us um and improve the um the the way in which our data is held and organized um and, and clearly that requires investment and that's something that um we again we're working with colleagues in ids to bring that business case together um, and I think that will help us to really um, improve on on that collective service that we can offer and the, the way in which some of that information may be more easily accessed um, by uh, the public. Um, I suppose the, the, the other key things to, to bring through are some of the learning that we've found over the course of um, the, the last six months to a year. So, um, for example, we've uh, identified that in some cases um, there have been business cases that have been coming through to um, financial performance group that may have an impact on the estate um, that may not have necessarily had the visibility of, um, of ourselves in asset management or others um, that, that work on the estate. And, and we've um, now working with um, colleagues in um, capital finance we are ensuring that um, the the first of all there's a um, requirement for those reports to um, include a statement around their engagement with um, asset management. 
Um, but secondly, that we are um, getting those reports from um, Financial Performance Group so that we um, can confirm that we've had sight of them and that, that, that um, we are aware of the, the estate implications or at least that we've had an opportunity to guide those implications. So that's something that we've um, started tightening up actually over the course of the last six months. Um, I think we also recognise that because the state, the the the, the organisation continually continually changes and evolves, and there's been some changes around the um, the the responsibilities for different aspects of hard and soft facilities management, we need to be really clear with um, members, with um, the directorates, and we and through our website with members of the public around where those responsibilities sit, and and again how um, inquiries can be dealt with. Um, and that's something that for certainly internally looking, um, we're going to be doing, um, taking a, a presentation through to um, director SLTs, to senior leadership teams, to, to be able to just ensure that the, there's a really clear understanding of roles and responsibilities, the governance process, um, and, and how decisions are taken. So actually bringing this paper together has been really helpful in terms of us um, being able to identify where there's some gaps and how we, we, we're going to, um, to, to um, deal with those, those gaps. I think the final point I was going to just draw out was, and, and this is on page 12 and 13 of the paper, which um, sets out around the survey of internal control, which was um, undertaken um, through our audit colleagues um, in November last year. And that asked um, two questions um, uh, around um, our estate. So first of all, it asked um, heads of service and chief officers whether they knew where to get advice and guidance from. Um, and secondly, around the um, decision making um, around our, our land and buildings and whether there was an understanding of um, how that was undertaken. And like I say, the, the, the results are set out in the two um, graphs that are shown. And I think what, what that has broadly shown is that where in directorates, where there is a um, very much a, a, um, a, a close engagement with the estate. So, for example, where you've got um, communities with waste um, services, environmental services, parks and countryside, and also city development with highways, um, flood risk management, museums, libraries, um, sorry, museums, um, active leads, etc. There's a really um, clear understanding around how the um, decisions are taken and how advice and guidance can be sought. In some of the service areas or, and directorates um, that probably have less of a direct link with, um, with the estate, so, for example, in children's and families where, yes, there's um, children's centres, but actually there's a lot of other parts of children's and families where um, their engagement with the estate is literally turning up and using a desk, i.e. not make, not getting involved in the decision making around buildings. It's probably not quite as embedded as we would like it. Again, recognising that. Um, we're um, doing some direct work with um, with those directorates um, where it is slightly weaker to ensure that we get that message through to their um, directorate SLTs. Um, Angela um, sits on the um, children's delivery um, board, the new de delivery board, and also I'm I'm going to start attending the um, children's and families asset management board, uh, asset management group, so uh, to to help. Um, to to ensure that the, there's a clearer understanding of the process and that we can support those directorates on on that journey, I suppose. So, um, all in all, the the, the paper sets out the um, the the um, review we've undertaken. Um, as I say, I, I think um, we we we're, we're basically um, saying that we are continually learning from our experience and and where we um, where we see um that the, there's gaps or or areas that we can improve we take um an approach to to um to to address those areas um and hopefully the the report does set out um the assurance framework that we've been um working to and we'll continue to work to moving forward is there anything angela polly richard you want to add uh thank you for that so i'll open up to members for questions and comments Yep. 
Castle Ringworth and then Castle Lynch as well. Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, I've got a whole series of questions about the report, and I'm trying to group them together. Um, first of all, I'm on page 54 of the, of the report, which is had it clearly communicate. <clears throat> and that, that's my comment. It's anything but. Uh, it's, it's landscape. And I, I personally find that really difficult to read, particularly if it's a complex document. You can't keep your, your eyes on track. Uh, and quite a, a problem for me, but I, I've got my, my lawyer's ruler. Uh, and uh, laid it on the text and, and uh, managed to, to make a bit of sense of it. But seriously, uh, books and newspapers are the shape they are. So, sorry, sorry Councillor Lingworth, yeah. I, I appreciate the comment on the structure of the document, but yeah. can we have questions actually? In, in indeed, I understand that, Chair, but I, I wanted to make the point very clearly that I find it a really difficult doc document to read, and that's because of the layout and typesetting, uh, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's something we could improve on. But coming back to the... The substance of the the material uh, on page fifty five, I've written at the bottom roles for Joe public and elected members. There seems to be entirely an officer's structure, uh, and that may be very good in terms of efficient running and so forth. But it also results in, uh, I think, a very conservative small c approach to ideas. That if you want to get big new ideas and you need to spread your net a bit wider than this and involving elected members would be a start involving the public would be better uh, and we should be looking actively for input from outside and not a closed system which is in a silo uh, labeled asset management and and, and audit uh, and doesn't see the light of day uh, that, i'm going to get a response on that but i've got some other questions later on but but uh, that's an, an early question i wanted to ask Yep, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Perhaps I'll start and then ask if anybody wants to add to that. Um, asset management um, in its widest gaze in terms of a state strategy it does consult with members what we would think quite expansively, certainly with our executive member, um, Councillor Cooper, with um, a bi-weekly briefing, including obviously coming to executive board for the strategies and um, certainly for the capital receipts program on an annual basis. And we would consult with ward members where there was consideration of any divestment of assets. And we would support the services in consulting with members when there is any change to service, which might result in a property implication as well. Um, in terms of external um, support, um, we would engage largely with the profession um, in terms around surveying. The um, estate management strategy was supported by a company called Turner and Townsend, and we liaise very closely with an organisation called ACES, which is the Association for Chief Estate Surveyors, which is a national um, network of authorities who have um, similar issues around their estate and management. And then in terms of consulting, um, certainly with, with users, and I'll, I'll perhaps let colleagues come on to the public, um, the Future Ways of Working programme is fundamentally about supporting our services and how we work differently. It had an extensive engagement led by our colleagues in human resources, uh, a number of surveys and a number of focus groups, which was um, um, sorry, I think I did speak to Councillor Flynn about this at the time, um, about how we want to access and the results were all available should anybody want to uh, take a look at that. Is there anything colleagues would like to add? Um, I, just in terms of the um, engagement with um, communities, I, I think that very much depends on the the, um, the, the response from um, ward members when we do the undertake the consultation. So certainly, where we've been asked um, by in in some wards to to attend stakeholder meetings, we've done that. Um, and um, you know, we we are very much guided by the 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 um, views of ward members as to how we might engage with um, communities around the city. Uh, Councillor Truswell, unless John wants to come in with his other no, questions, no, no, no. yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> Councillor Truswell. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um... Mark did refer to this in his, his, his very helpful and lengthy uh, re report. Pages 51 to 53 talk about the government structures to which he alluded, and they do seem to be, to the casual reader like myself, a little bit Byzantine. So I suppose what I'm seeking on behalf of the committee is an assurance that they are streamlined, 
that they are fit for purpose and that they don't lead to the duplication of officer time and resources, precious that that is. On page 58, I'll just turn to it and quote from it. Paragraph 15. Um, the second sentence down says it's been noted that input around estate matters from the health and safety team could be more effective. Now, I just find that a slightly surprising comment in an organisation the size of Leeds City Council, because clearly health and safety is critical in terms of protecting the public who use our facilities, the staff who work in them, and avoiding reputational damage of anything that might emerge on the health and safety front so again I'm seeking assurance that that integration and that closer involvement of the health and safety team is um is going on a pace um on page 61 under the green heading clearly communicate and there's slight irony in this from my point of view it says ensure that changes around the delivery of hard and soft facilities management responsibilities are effectively communicated via direct. Could someone translate that into English for me? <laughs> and my, my, my final point is a general point, and it's about resources. And, and, and I think the response to John's question, John Ellingworth's question, touched upon this. I'm finding as a ward member, and I'm sure this is true of other ward members, that where we are looking at buildings that come under the aegis of asset management, whether they are buildings that have been declared surplus to requirements or they've come under the authorities management or there's a new lease or a renewal of a lease or the consideration of a community asset transfer that the process is incredibly lengthy now i'm prepared to accept that part of that is that legal processes can be complicated but i do get the impression that from time to time these perhaps smaller scale initiatives that nevertheless are of crucial importance to the residents of our communities and people who run especially third sector organizations kind of get displaced by bigger ticket challenges um and it's frequently the case that people will get so frustrated that they come to ward members we of course get out our sharp sticks and poke them into a relative part of officer's anatomy and the whole process then starts again so it's really uh, the, the question around the resources available for the for the management and for those processes to be undertaken in a timely way that doesn't frustrate the community, key organisations or ward members. Okay, I'll I'll start. Hopefully I won't miss anything. If I do, I'm sure um, colleagues will, will jump in. Um, so I suppose I'll deal with the easy one first. Well, I think it's easy. Um, the, the hard and soft FM. Um, so hard FM is, is effectively the bricks and mortar um, and and management um, and investment into to the, the 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 physical asset itself. Soft FM is the um, the the day to day management of the building, so cleaning, security, front of house, etc. So hopefully that and so soft FM is um, Richard. Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of the um the the governance and um your query councillor trustwell around whether it's streamlined um I, I i would give assurance that it is streamlined um that we're having the um the the there's the a very clear process within um the the um governance for things to be escalated through that um we um it is streamlined in the way that um not everything goes to a state corporate estate management board a lot of the matters that are coming through um the director asset management groups um are either resolved in those director asset management groups or simply get to a state management group that don't necessarily have to go all the way through so we do ensure that we we are only having the conversations where those discussions need to take place um in terms of health and safety, um, uh, members and colleagues are, are probably aware that um, the, the, there's, um, the, the council's not necessarily had a, a health and safety lead um, in, um, for, for, for 18 months or so um, in the way that we previously had under um, the guise of Chrisingham. Um, and um, that has meant that 
Um, the the engage the, it's not saying that there's been no engagement with health and safety colleagues. That engagement has been um, with with more junior staff. So certainly Richard's team on a day to day basis, they've still we, we've still en ensured that we've had um, that input from health and safety colleagues. Um, as Liz Col Lisa Culver has um, joined the organisation, it's now given us that opportunity to ensure that we re-establish that input from a, a very senior level. And uh, as such, we are um, reforming the estate leadership team, which is effectively the people that you can see here, to also include Lisa um, within that um, so, so, so that we can um, have um, a, a broader strategic um, discussion about how we can um, uh, give the assurance and, and ensure that, um, that that every aspect of our work is being done in in the right way um, and taking on board the the latest guidance and 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 um, good practice. Um, in terms of um, our activity around disposals, leases, um, community asset transfers, etc., um, I think. It, it, it's a, a fair comment to say that sometimes that takes longer than than people would like. Um, I think there's various reasons for that. Council Trussell, you noted that the, there's um, legal processes to go through, um, and in some cases they are um, slowed e either because of um, resource or complexity um, within the council, but equally um, through those um, wanting to move um, the matters forward, um, purchases. Um, those wanting to enter into leases, sometimes they're not necessarily resourced or not able to get the, um, the, the advice they require in a timely way to be able to move forward. So I think um, it, it's, um, it, it's true to say that some things don't move at the pace we would like. I think in terms of our internal resources, um, clearly they're that we would like to be able to move things quicker in some cases. Our resources dictate that we have to move in 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 um, the the speed that we can. But we do go through a process of trying to prioritise to to ensure that we um, bring in the the income that we're targeted to bring in, but also support some of those community activities that that you've noted um, in in the most appropriate way. Linking across, of course, to um, other directors such as communities, um, housing environment where there's other input required. Just, just a very quick comment. I hope that this committee in future will keep a close eye on the health and safety issue that has been elucidated to us today. No, absolutely. Councillor Flynn. Thanks, Paul. Um, the, the, the report um, provides assurances that the internal controls of estate management uh, are, are fit for purpose. Um, not quite sure if you're able to answer this, but um, I know that estate rationalisation has been going on for probably more than 10 years or so under the pandemic, uh, but rather um, a boot up the backside, as it were, to um, what we were actually doing, building, et cetera. Uh, what, what I'm really interested in is now we have something like 50% of the staff uh, working from home, and these are staff who were normally in a workplace as opposed to people who normally work from home. Um, God forbid if ever the staff had to come back to a, a workplace, um, do we have sufficient, adequate accommodation in the right place for those staff to come back to and is the it infrastructure uh, in the right place and at the right stage to support staff who've actually come back to work i'm thinking about the service to the public here that we actually provide uh, and i'm well aware that um ids are in the middle of a fairly large rationalization of the uh, of the it um, estate as well i've got another one after that but i think it's a legal one Okay, yeah. So, so um, I, I suppose currently our estate, broadly speaking, is is operating at about fifty percent capacity. Um, different days, obviously, you get to see different levels of staffing, different buildings as well, where you've got different services, and and that's governed by their their service delivery. So, there's certainly, um, I, I suppose, scope for for staff to spend more time within our estate. But equally, looking into the future, you 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 might imagine that we might need to uh, again review how we um, release some space um, or let out space to to ensure that we have a, the, an estate of the right size and, and efficient. Um, 
In terms of um, the, the IT infrastructure, as part of the um, Future Ways of Working programme that we had as we moved through the pandemic, we, that, that included um, colleagues from um, HR, it included colleagues from IDS, so that we were able to join up and ensure that we'd got um, the right input from, um, and, and that there was an awareness of the overall strategy and that that, that strategy was influenced um, both from the IT infrastructure side, but also from the estate side. So um, members will note that obviously there's been a rollout of new um, video conferencing equipment. Um, the, there's been upgrades in some buildings around the, the um, Wi-Fi connectivity and other IT infrastructure. Um, review of printing, etc. So, so that we have um, done that in parallel, um, and and that there has been awareness on both sides of the work that's been undertaken. That's been really critical, actually, in terms of Richard's team managing the buildings on a day to day basis as well, and ensuring that, for example, meeting rooms and and so on can be be used as effectively as possible. Yep. I don't think that quite answered the question I asked, which is if all the staff who are currently working at home came back to work, is there uh, sufficient and adequate accommodation available uh, for them to come back to? And is the IT support actually in place? Uh, and I ask because um, I went to a meeting in over the road a few days ago and had to evict uh, a member of the planning team who uh, was, was in an office that we wanted to sort of use. Not very satisfactory. I have to say there's another one after that which is a legal question um councillor flynn um if should the council pivot to bring everybody back to work who's currently working elsewhere um we've certainly got sufficient capacity right now in our estate to cope with that um the other points i would make is a lot of our our colleagues, our, our LCC staff are actually working on partner estates as well. So we have a number of people who work through the NHS estate, through the police estate. And I think it's that broader footprint that we're now looking at. Mark does an extensive piece of work uh, through WICA, looking at what's called the one public estate, so that as public organisations moving forward, they can be more effective about making sure their own estates are maximum utilisation. Um, I think that's what I wanted to say. And, and also just to say about the continuous process, um, I suspect we will never find the right footprint because our services are continuously changing. So we have been on this um, uh, estate rationalisation for over a decade now. And I think we will continue to, to you know, ebb and flow, expand and contract as our service provision changes. Again, I don't think it quite answered the question I was asking, which is if all of the staff who are currently working at home came back to work, is there sufficient accommodation in the right place with the right infrastructure to support a return to work? So I would just add to that. Obviously, we'd have to know what they're coming back into to find out what they aren't doing at home and then right size the estate around that. But if they wanted to come back and sit at a desk or perch, we're quite confident that could happen. Yeah, I think I'll give up at that stage. Um, I'll come back to it though at a future future date. On page fifty, I think this is the legal officer. Um, in in the first um, box, it's the director of um, city development under officer roles and responsibilities. Um, three or four lines down, it talks about there are specific delegations provided by full council to the director, etc., etc., etc. Um, my understanding is that this is not the full council uh, responsibility, but should come from the leader. Um, don't expect anyone to answer that this morning, but I just, I'd welcome clarification on that at some future stage. Thank you. What page was that? Sorry, Councillor Flynn. Page 50. By, by the sounds of that, sir, one to be answered after the meeting. Uh, Councillor Dowson. Thank you, Chair. Um, first thing I'd like to do is, uh, is say well done, which uh, doesn't come out of my mouth very often these days. But um, the decarbonisation of public buildings, the work that's gone on there, I think, uh, you know, you've, you've you're done a cracking job. So uh, the question, or my first question is, how much are we re reliant on one-off government grants to do this kind of work? And how much are we taking out of our, our own internal uh, budget? Um, so that would be number one. Number two is around leases. Um, I think I think I've got Mark on speed dial, to be honest. But um, 
it's we offer leases we negotiate and you're right they do take far too long to do but you know due diligence you have to do this thing because you want to make sure if an organization takes on a building they do actually have the the wherewithal to maintain it going forward and, and the responsibility won't revolve back on the council in in 10 15 years time um sometimes um and we know this money only comes into the city because it comes via third sector organizations the council are not allowed to either bid for it or or it, the stipulations within it um we often offer 10 and 15 years leases but a lot of the organizations who are going for funding need a 25 year lease to be able to access that money to to get money into the city to maintain buildings and and improve the ones that they're in already so um i'm asking there that we actually take a, a closer look and perhaps instead of being very dogmatic look at, uh, on a case by case basis around the the history to make sure that we're making the right decision and not just the one that's convenient because that's the way we've always done it in the past um and i usually <laughs> preface some of my questions by saying i'm new to this so i don't actually know this panel um so i might be asking the wrong people but uh, again it's it's one for polly um, you, you started um, by saying how um, your department weren't responsible for highways, um, which is which is fair enough. But um, your department is responsible, and and I represent an inner city ward where we're very concerned around um, the environment. Um, we have a lot of pollution and, and so on with cars, et cetera. Um, but it seems impossible to actually develop a system where we can easily put in street trees. Um, and I wonder, would that fall to highways or would that fall to you? And how would we as elected members on behalf of our residents promote and get street trees in, in inner city areas and not just the city centre? Thank you. Just before I answer that one, that's not really a governance question per se, but I think we'll ask. And so I'm not going to ask you to ask it from that perspective, but I think there's probably a general governance question around responsibilities and how you work, figure out who does it. Okay, so I'll pick up the two questions from me. So the first one about government grant. So we have been really successful in the government grant, which is really, as the schemes progressed around public sector decarbonisation, it's really focused on decarbonisation of heat. And the reason it's focused on that is because at the moment that is still in its sort of infancy, which means that you're not at price parity if you were replacing a gas boiler for an air source heat pump at the moment a gas boiler is still likely to be the cheaper option and that's why that government grant exists because they're trying to develop that market and get us to a point where actually we do get to price parity so the decarbonisation of heat is still more challenging for us as an organisation in terms of putting funding into that however there are still lots of other things we can do on an investor safe basis that we are looking to do so for example led lighting better building management systems better controls um, when we do replacement of equipment, so things like air handling units, looking at the efficiency of those, so starting to reduce, make all of our sort of, you know, pool equipment more energy efficient, for example, things like solar, you can do on investor save. So there's, there's lots that we can do on an investor save. I think decarbonisation of heat is still more challenging, but that is the whole purpose that the government grant still exists. So I think we're still working through that learning and looking at how we start to to kind of embed that more. Um, in terms of the um, street trees one, um, it is still a challenge. I think it's probably something I'd like to come back on. So obviously from the 1st of April, I pick up responsibility for what is currently parks and countryside. It is something we've started talking about. We're working with um, an organisation called Street um, Trees for Streets even. Um, and looking at how we can make that work, where we can get community involvement to help support some of that funding. But I would say we haven't quite got there yet. So is that something that I can come back to kind of post the 1st of April as we start to work through that? But we do work alongside Highways colleagues. We don't work in isolation. OK, and then um, just to answer the question about leases. Um, so um, we um, are, are quite flexible and, and open to having conversations about what, what the terms of a lease might be. 
Um, and and I think part of that is us understanding those those issues that you outlined, Councillor Dowson, in terms of um, and any grant funding um, requirements um, and and um, the ambitions and and so on of organisations. As you quite rightly say, we've got to ensure that we we are protecting the organisation by not give not not offloading um, a liability that they're not. Um, understanding of um, and that they are effectively set up and resourced and and so on to be able to manage that into that 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 um, property in the long term but yeah I mean if if there are grant funding requirements that dictate that it's got to be a 25 year or even longer term lease then um, there's plenty of examples around the city where we have done that um, to allow um, the broader ambitions to be realized any follow-ups and it's it's just one last one I forgot because I mean we're very lucky in Leeds we've got some absolutely fantastic heritage buildings the problem with heritage buildings is they do actually throw up an awful lot of issues that you perhaps wouldn't get at the moment with a with a with a modern building um with that in mind and um, we've been talking about health and safety um and and lots of other issues around heritage buildings um I'm wondering what the view is um, amongst your colleagues around uh, the maintenance of heritage ass assets? So this year we're going to undertake a programme of condition surveys specifically linked to the heritage assets. Um, and part of that is, I think sometimes we will have to look outwardly for funding around things like lottery funding and things like that to support it but we really need to understand the size and scale of the problem first I think almost before we get to that so we do you know for, for example this year we're looking at a window replacement scheme at Lotherton that will be sympathetic to the building so we do invest um, some of our maintenance program within to that within those assets but I think if we get to points where there are um, really large financial requirements and we also will look at outwardly rather than just rely on our own funding but I think we need to understand the problem fully before we can reach a conclusion on that. Any thought? No. Uh, Councillor Harron? Three comments, two questions. Firstly, I couldn't agree more with the point about it goes from um, what are my names now? From a landscape to the other way around. And why do we, it's on corporate government more than anywhere else? Um, supplementary to that, why do you have a different numbering system to your page? Mm -hmm. Why you're not? We're on page nine. You're on. Uh, and we'll point... take that up with the clerks and, and the document creation, shall we? Uh, can we? We don't want to debate. Back, but no, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the point uh, Councillor Trussell made about delays in dealing with the state management. I have personal experience of that, and it's not the most fleet-footed department. But two questions: um, Does somebody somewhere have a list of all the assets that the city council owns? And I mean, I don't want to see it, but there is one list, right? And the other question is, none of this includes schools, which must be uh, the value of theirs. That state must be at least as big as all the rest of them. Does all this work you do about health and safety and, and uh, decarbonisation also apply in uh, your equivalent in, in, in schools? Okay, the, fir the first question is quite an easy one. Yes, we do have an asset register which um, records all of the assets um, that we have, all, all of the buildings that we have. Now, when it comes to pe individual pieces of land, they are recorded slightly differently. <laughs> we obviously have register uh, uh, that we, we went through a voluntary registration process with Land Registry um, a number of years ago. Um, and, and so we, we do know what we own. Um, in terms of that asset register, that does also include schools as well. Um, and certainly um, while this um paper does not focus on on the school estate um there are others um the the, the that governance process is managed through um the children's and families directorate and there is certainly input from colleagues in asset management and regeneration about the um planned maintenance program on those properties um and uh, as well as investment in new and Polly, Polly can probably come in but Polly's team have also been involved in some of the decarbonization works in those schools as well yeah, so it's just going, sorry, it's just going to add that 
kind of got two hats on here. So one is the planned maintenance, which is it within the remits that was set out. The other part is the more general net zero role. When we look for funding, we don't limit it to our own estate. So some of the funding we brought in, we have targeted at our school estate. So we will work within their governance structures and things to deliver um, things like de the decarbonisation programme. We, we certainly don't limit it to one. So it's whatever the funding is that's available. The, chair, the officer said at the beginning, we are starting to consolidate, consolidate ownership in the state management away from directorates, which wasn't terribly reassuring. Are you sure you've got them all? Yes, I, I mean, I, I think this comes back to the comment I made around our um, information governance systems um, for the estate. So, yes, we do have an asset list of all buildings um that um the the way in which that might be broken down um it, you know is is up for debate and that's something that we will need to um review as we start to implement a new system but yes we 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 have a list of all um buildings as part of the asset register you, you couldn't do the annual accounts without i suppose really but it was reassuring any other questions or comments from members? No. So moving on to the recommendation. Members are requested to A, consider and note the positive assurance set out in the Statement of Internal Control relating to estate management attached at Appendix A to this report. I will take silence as acceptance for that recommendation. There we go. Thank you very much. So moving on to the next item on our agenda. I find it. There we go. Uh, the Grand Parton Annual Report and IT Audit Report 2021-2022. Thank you, Chair. There's two Grant Thornton reports uh, for members to consider today. Uh, the first one relates to the, the reports uh, on the, uh, Grant Thornton's audit findings with regard to the Council's value for money arrangements. The report doesn't identify any statutory or key recommendations, but it does make a number of recommendations for improvement uh, and secondly, uh, the there's Grant Thornton's IT audit report, which uh, covers the control environment for the council's main financial systems, that makes recommendations and also comments on recommendations from previous years. And with that, I can pass over to, to Grant Thornton. Uh, th thank you very much, Richard. So I will take the first report, Chair, on, on the VFM arrangements, and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Chris, who's uh, from our IT specialist team for the for the second report. Uh, I'll try and keep my, my comments relatively brief. Um, this is the 2122 VFM report. It builds on the report that we did uh, for 2021, which came to this committee back in October. So it's only sort of six months ago. So we tried to focus this really in terms of any key developments over the last six months. And I think both this report and the report that Chris will do in a moment, it's all around trying to bring forward and get back onto a a normal timetable in terms of uh, the, the accounts and VFM and, and, and overall audit work um, at, at, at the council and, and these two reports coming today certainly help with that. Uh, page 69 on the exec summary chair, uh, as Richard said, there's no um, significant weaknesses and therefore no resulting statutory or, or key recommendations arising. And that's that's a good outcome for the council um, for, a, for an organisation uh, of, of, of this size um, to not highlight any particular issues in their, those areas is, is a good outcome. Uh, as Richard said, there are um, you know small number of, of, of improvement recommendations. So they're the, the sort of lower level recommendations to effectively enhance and improve existing controls and processes uh, that have been raised and, and discussed with, uh, with relevant officers and their responses are, are included within the, the detailed section of the report. Turning over the page to page 70, Chair, I've just tried to summarise there the outcomes from the th three particular themes that this piece of work focuses on. So the first of which is, is the financial sustainability of the Council. Um, as I say, we've not highlighted any, any issues there. Clearly, uh, the Council, along with uh, a, a number of other local authorities within the sector, uh, does remain under uh, you know significant uh, financial pressures and and challenges and i think a lot of the detailed recommendations that we made back in september october of last year you'll note later on in the report and um, we've noted an update on them but we believe that the uh, 
the effective comments that we made last uh, six months ago, they're still relevant. They're still things that officers and members should be aware of uh, in terms of the pro uh, the financial challenges, I guess, facing the, the sector as a whole. And clearly that'll be something that we continue to monitor in our regular discussions with Richard and, and Victoria and, and the team as part of our 22-23 uh, audit work. On governance, um, we've highlighted um, some issues, I guess, that we've reported on a number of occasions to this committee uh, around the, the accounts process specifically. And uh, we're currently working through that with uh, with the finance team as part of our 21-22 uh, accounts audit process. And we hope to bring a an ISA 260 report on that piece of work to the next meeting of this committee in, in June. Uh, we did raise a, an improvement recommendation around the um, need to review and, and potentially update certain key key documents, including the, the code of conduct. And then the final area, improving economy, efficiency and effectiveness. So effectively, there's sort of performance management arrangements of the council. How's the council doing in terms of um, delivering its, its, its key services uh, and how is it performing against its, its key uh, performance indicators? Uh, we've looked through that uh, and again, no, no significant issues arising there. A couple of improvement recommendations have been raised. So from my point of view, I think overall, um, you know, it's, it's, it's um, a broadly positive report um, for the council. No significant issues arising, but notwithstanding that, you know, we, we still highlight, I guess, some of the, the financial challenges which do remain live here at Leeds and indeed across the sector. So I'll, I'll pause at that point, Chair, but obviously happy to take any questions you or other members may have. Thank you. So if we can just focus questions, comments on that particular bit, and then we'll come to the IT bit. So any questions or comments? Yeah, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, I, I know in the report, I can't see you actually, so apologies. Um, uh, you, you have put a list of further actions, which uh, comments on the on the actions that the council is actually taking. Are you fully satisfied that recommendations you've made and the action that's been taken by the council are satisfactory uh, to the best of your knowledge? Uh, yes, overall, I think you're referring to sec section eight, Councillor Fun, in terms of pages 90 and uh, 91 and 90 uh, to 93. So I think in the main, we, we are satisfied. I mean, clearly. Um, you know, some of those recommendations, particularly the first three um, around the sort of financial position, reserves, MRP, they're going to be ongoing things that we keep monitoring as part of our, our audit work uh, going forward. Um, but we've noted the, um, you know, the responses to uh, that the council's made uh, in relation to those recommendations. I think on um, uh, a couple of them in terms of sort of workforce uh, and um, some of the benchmarking stuff uh, we've we've highlighted that we think this they would still be uh, beneficial for the council but at, at present um council's not uh, taking those forward i think you know overall we're we're, we're comfortable with that uh, councillor flynn on the basis that these are improvement level recommendations where uh, they are in the main to enhance um existing a, a arrangements had they been, um, you know, key level recommendations or statutory recommendations that actions hadn't formally been taken, then that would be a different matter, Councillor Flynn. But because there aren't any of those higher level, higher risk um, areas in the report, um, you know, there's there's no sort of further issues or actions from from our point of view on those. Thanks very much. We can come back to it next year, I'm sure. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, hopefully a very easy question to start with on page 80 when I get to it. Um, there's reference on page 80 to um, scrutiny committee arrangements are in place through 11 scrutiny boards, which hold executive boards members to account. Now, as far as I'm aware, we've only got five scrutiny boards. So I just wonder whether there are any other uh, committees that fall within what might be seen as Grant Thornton as scrutiny boards. Um, coming back to my other points, on page 85, there is reference to business rate collection. And I know that the Grant Thornton report is kind of, uh, it's looking back historically, but I just wonder if the officers could update us on how much progress we are making in terms to, of getting back to 
um, pre-pandemic levels of business rate collection, which is absolutely crucial to the council's finances. On page 87, um, and again, I just refresh my memory by turning to that, there is the, the reference to, to benchmarking. And I just wanted to kind of explore this in a bit more detail so I understand what we're benchmarking and what we're comparing with. Is it a straightforward comparison like with like as to what other authorities are spending on a particular area of activity? Or is it a bit more flexible than that? For example, if we've taken a political decision in Leeds to spend more money on a particular aspect of activity, whether it's community safety, whether it's it's, it's climate emergency work. And on page 91, there seems to be a civilised disagreement between Grant Thornton and our officers around the issue of identifying statutory and discretionary spending. And I'm just, again, would like a bit more of a detailed insight as to how we're resolving that, if indeed we are. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Trustwell. So I think, um, I mean, Richard, I'm sure, will we'll comment on all four of those points. I think I'll take... Um, the third and the fourth point, if 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 I may, I think the the, the first two are probably ones for um, for Richard to comment on initially. But in terms of the comparison um, benchmarking report on page eighty seven, so that that report is is, is purely um, the I guess the figures that have been supplied centrally by um, the core cities in this case, where we're comparing Leeds against the other the other core cities so in terms of the nuances around certain decisions being taken to invest in certain areas and all that that wouldn't necessarily be part of this but i guess it's not trying to do that councillor trustwell one of the one of the questions external audit yet and i'm sure uh, internal audit colleagues will agree is uh, from from members in local government or non-execs in the nhs is how do we compare how do we compare with x y and z so I suppose what we're trying to do in, in with with that piece of work there is is show where you are against the other core cities. I think there's other references in in terms of your reserves position, your borrowing position, and there may well be valid reasons why Leeds is in a particular place in terms of it being very high or very low. But I suppose it's it's a can opener, if you like, Councillor Trustwell, for for I guess the likes of yourselves and other members to say, you know, why are we near the top on this one, or why are we near the bottom on that one, and for officers to I guess justify you know, where Leeds sits in that particular, uh, in, in, a, in any particular table. So so it is just purely a, 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 an analysis against the, the, the total spend of, of, of Leeds compared to the other the other core cities. Um, on page 91, Council Trustwell, uh, yes, I mean, it is fair, fair comment that um, we, we've, we've raised a, that, that recommendation in the, in, in, in the previous report six months ago. Um, and it is a fair point to say that 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 is not something that's done really across the sector in terms of drawing out that statutory versus non-statutory um, services. Um, but that is to say that, you know, if someone did did go down the route of doing it, it may well be well be beneficial. What we've tried to say in the right hand column is sort of acknowledge that, it, you know, it, it's, it's not it's not widely, widely done in, in the sector. Um, but another twist on it could be, and coming back to one of your early points, Councillor Trustful, is where you, you as members have, have made a particular decision to, to invest in a particular service or area. What's the implications of that in terms of the overall savings plan for the authority? So if we invest in, in such and such a service of X million pounds, what does that do to the savings plan and what other things do we potentially need to move out of or, or, or rephase or, or come up with a different savings plan? So that we've <clears throat> slightly tried to... To, to tweak that one on, on page 91, but I'm sure Richard may, uh, may may have a comment on that. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Just picking up uh, each of the points in turn, Council Trustful. The first one, just in terms of the number of scrutiny boards, um, just looking on the Council's website, there is 11 there, but some of those sort of consultative scrutiny as well. So there is 11 in total, but also includes things like tenant scrutiny. But I can see where the 11 has come from from, from the report. In terms of um, business rates, we do report this uh, on a monthly basis uh, in terms of the um, council's uh, financial health report that gets received at uh, executive board. I haven't got the report in front of me, but from, from memory, uh, I do know in terms of performance for 22-23 is in terms of collection to date is better than we were in 21-22. But... I would accept it is slightly behind where we were in 20, sorry, in, in uh, 
2021, which were the last sort of normal year that we, we, we can sort of talk about, but collection rates are improving. Uh, we do take account of um, where we think we're going to be in terms of collection. So normally, over the fullness of time, we expect to recover 99% of our, our business rates. Um, but I do know in 22, 23, we've got it at a slightly lower level uh, than, than that. In terms of the, the benchmarking, I think that the comment really just back to um, Grant Thornton uh, was just really just to reflect that we do actively benchmark in the services that we provide. And I think in terms of uh, adult social care, there's a really, really good example in there in terms of the way we've benchmarked through benchmarking clubs, uh, in terms of other local authorities, in terms of looking at costs to see where we've got higher cost and then where there's opportunity for cost reductions and for income generation as well. I'm sure if the service were here today, they're talking about all the metrics they do in, in respect to that. And that's also reflected in the fact in terms of on financial performance, they continue to deliver a, a balanced budget position because the savings they come up with that are informed by the benchmarking work that they do um, means that they're deliver deliverable level of savings and they do come back you know, one is balanced. And secondly, that performance compares favourably with many other local authorities that do struggle to deliver a balanced budget position in terms of, of adult social care. And then finally, um, just in terms of the statutory, non-statutory uh, split, um, again, we, we've made representations back just around the practical side of, of doing that. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've been told by another Section 151 officer there's over 1,600 statutory responsibilities for a local authority so to try and break the budget down into that makes it really difficult uh and the other one is just where statutory starts and, and ends um so for instance the statutory responsibility to deliver uh, a library service is one library sufficient or several libraries equally there's a statutory responsibility around say homelessness but the prevention work we do in respect of that isn't necessarily statutory so it, it's it's really difficult i mean What's the benefit of what Grant Thornton say? It does make us consider actually, should we be doing that or what the benefits would be? And, and if we choose not to, then at least we're satisfied why we're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I, I'm glad that I've teased out those two responses from Richard because I think they're very helpful. Um, we, as a committee, have always said that we want to see things benchmarked so that we can have, we have comparisons. Uh, in terms of the benchmarking table that's on page 87 i'm not sure how helpful it is i mean for example we've got total public health right down near the bottom of the table where we're very low now if i was a casual reader of this i think well that's deplorable Lee city council very low by way of comparison in terms of public health expenditure i suspect the explanation for this is that when the public health function transferred across to local authorities it came with the central government grant and that grant is still way, way below what even the government says it should be. So the comparison is an unfavourable one, but, it, you know, it's not us, Gov. It, you know, the responsibility rests elsewhere. I mean, I'd be open to correction if I'm wrong, but I think that's the explanation. And to some extent, it does militate against the value of just having these very, very superficial and crude um, comparisons. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Councillor Harren. I read the front page and the, all the information in this document is was 49 weeks old when it was written and it's 51 weeks old now. Is that going to be normal in future? We always have to wait a year to get the information. And if so, is there anything we can do to accelerate that? A private company that produced its accounts 51, year, 51 weeks after the year end would be in real trouble on the stock exchange. So I think, that, well, the, the, the work has been done this year, Councillor Allen, it does relate to the 21-22 financial year. So it's not the, the, the work itself is 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 not um is not a year old. Um I think it comes back to the uh challenges within the public sector um arena in terms of the timeliness of, of accounts and VFM work, which I think we shared a report with the council um, a couple of weeks ago, which I believe has been circulated to members or certainly should have been, um, that highlights some of the reasons why there is a um, a challenge and a backlog in terms of the uh, external audit sign-off across the sector. So, as I mentioned in my 
presentation, this is actually bringing forward the the the, the work um, by completing the value for money work in advance of the accounts work to try and get the Leeds City Council accounts and audit process back onto a normal uh, audit cycle. So at the previous meeting, um, we obviously concluded the 2021 work. Um, we're aiming to report our ISA 260 on 21-22 accounts to the July committee, and we've set a target of um, the 22-23 accounts being reported to the February 24 committee uh, of, 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 the, of the audit committee. So what that will hopefully do if we can deliver to that timetable is effectively within a 12-month period try to conclude three years worth of, of, um, of annual accounts at Leeds, which would then get the authority back onto a, a normal audit timetable for the first year of the new PSAA contract. I suppose the other thing you've got to remember as well is that one of the issues that held up last year's accounts was the national issue of accounting for infrastructure assets, which affected all organisations. Um, and that was a factor in, in, in well, one of the factors in, in, in the delay of, of, of Leeds accounts audit last year. So I take your point that this is about 21-22 financial year. I suppose as a sector and as a firm, you know, Grant Thornton and the other audit firms with, working within that sector do recognise that. And all firms are trying to get back onto a, a, a normal audit cycle. But it is a challenging position for for, for all organisations working in this particular sector at present for all the issues in that recent report that we circulated uh, a couple of weeks ago. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. So when will we see the 2022-23 equivalent of this document? Uh, our target for that, uh, Councillor Harrand, is the November meeting. So uh, we will have had three years' worth of VFM reports um, within sort of a 12-, 13-month period. Any more questions, comments on the aspect of the report before we move on to the item? Yeah. Thank you. Um, on page 75, again, it's back to your benchmarking. Um, and I do recognise that benchmarking does open that kind of, you know, for questions and, and, and often what's presented to you, it's the detail behind it that becomes more interesting. I do get that. Um, but you make, you make a comment in your um, second to the last paragraph on page 75, about the general fund reserves and earmarked reserves being lower or the lowest of all core cities as at the 31st of March 22. And then in the next paragraph, you, you, you recognise that there's some um, plans to increase that level going forward. Um, what I can't see easily and, and, and would be helped in, incredibly if you could just say, well, you know, what does that second paragraph there say to the first? Um, you know, so do, does the um, the plan to increase the general reserve over the period to March 2028, does that then bring us bring Leeds that more in line with what the core city's average might be? I accept that the requirement for a level of reserves is, sp is specific to a council. Um, I get that. But just as a generic, how does that compare? I mean, in theory, obviously, it would bring Leeds more up and up to that average line, but we don't know what the other core cities are going to do. So they may may increase as well. I think anything that and, and recognising, you know, resources are finite and there's a lot of competing demands. Um, I think, you know, we're certainly supportive of the, the MTFS position that recognises that Leeds' level of reserves are low compared to uh, to. Um, compared to uh, local authorities and therefore you know the council themselves have recognized that these need to need to increase and and certainly you know that from our point of view does increase the sustainability and resilience of, of leads um you know if it if it mirrors where the the mtfs is uh, is projected leads to be uh, it's difficult to say where where leads would then fit in three years time on that on that league table because obviously the other authorities may be taking a similar view uh, but if it if it, if it improves the resilience of Leeds position for you know significant shocks to the uh, financial position then that is a positive from from our perspective any other questions comments on that particular bit okay if we can move on to the IT bit please hi <coughs> good morning um so we completed a 
IT audit against three main systems. There's an SAP system, the FMS system, which is for the financials, and Academy, which is uh, for the benefits. We performed what we call a roll forward audit, which we asked the question, was any, were there any differences between last year's audit and this year's audit? Uh, if there were no changes, uh, we took the view that as there were no changes, we st still stayed in the same control environment. One of the questions earlier was about privileged access. We checked privileged access and security management for the three systems. Um, if you go to page, on here. Um, page 105, uh, the first thing we found was there were user accounts identified with inappropriate access in FMS. This is financial system. Um, this is where privileged access comes into it. What we are looking here for is people who have administrative access um, that also have a crossover with financial responsibilities. That is a big red flag, um, and we we highlight this. Um, as regards numbers, there were 14 users uh, that could assign access, uh, and this was highlighted to uh, in the report. For SAP, which is the payroll, uh, we found there were 24 users that had privileged access. Um, I don't want to go into the detail unless you want me to, but I'll try and, I'll try and present this in English as opposed to IT. We performed additional procedures on the on the payroll system, and we found there was actually no um, no changes to tables. This was about going in with SAP. Unlike other systems, there are multiple ways of going and have administrative access. It's not like you can go in and have an admin access or a manager access. There are there are about thirty odd different ways, and we have to take it and look at the whole thing. Um, we went through, did some additional procedures um, and found there weren't changes to tables. Um, however, as we're looking at risk on this, it is, it is quite significant. Um, we did ask the question um, and we had some additional evidence provided to us afterwards. Um, and it, it, we're working with the, the officers, we came back with the um, the access had been removed, that the inappropriate access had been removed, and um, it, this the access was provided only to the administrators. So this is the IT people as opposed to the finance people. There were no significant changes to tables in that period. That was the additional work we did, um, and then we come on to. Point, th point three in the report, which is going to be page 108. There were, on these privileged ac user access accounts, um, these ones that apply to, that go into the production environment and go into your database. Um, we found there were just some weaknesses there on the way the accounts are operated. Uh, some of this could be down to the not reviewing the accounts. Some of this could be down to, you know, just reviewing who goes in and out of those accounts. These are, these are uh, the administration accounts. Uh, and then, again, these, these were um, just general sort of observations on, on the three systems. And then the fourth point made this year was um, there were some cyber security controls. So we do a review upon cyber security and there was some, they weren't major. These are what we call process improvements. And hopefully these are things that will be implemented over the next, um, next few months. Looking at the, Issues we raised in the previous year. Um, there were the first point on there, user accounts identified with inappropriate access in SAP. Again, it comes back down to, we, we did a complete review of SAP user access. Um, some of these hadn't been uh, remediated. 
there was a uh, inadequate control of generic accounts in the FMS database. Again, this is financial system and the benefit systems. Um, there were accounts that not being not being monitored. Um, and that was it, really. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Uh, bearing in mind, we're slightly running over than we normally do, so try to, uh, brevity is preferable. Councillor Flynn. Well, I'm, I'm a fully qualified Luddite, so bear with me uh, when we're talking about IT. Uh, also a great believer in SOD's law. Um, I noticed that uh, on pages uh, 111, 112, 113, it's section four under the um, findings of, of last year, which you've just touched on. Um, it, it appears uh, that your recommendations from last year have not been fully complied with in at least three of the items that have been raised. Um, are you satisfied that the recommendations you made last year will be fully complied with? Uh, and what do you think about the recommendations that you've made this year? Will they be fully complied with? So on the comments for um, page 111, uh, there is a management comment there that's saying there is some work being done uh, for a new system. Um, the, uh, for Academy, they're in the process of purchasing a new audit logging system which sits inside the system. We believe this allowed to log what each user is undertaking. So from a going forward perspective, yes, that, that, will, that will be adequate. Um, monitoring is something that is done unless you understand what you're doing you need the right people to do that monitoring you need the right people to understand the roles and the, and the jobs that people are looking at so that's something that needs to be worked on um technically uh, okay page 112 also is that is about the academy system and about the audit logging and page 113 um it's about policies so this is this uh, and the response is the officers in ids will look into potential benefits of establishing corporate policies in these areas um if those policies are there people will know, know what to do um and how to do it oh, yeah yeah any other questions councillor trustball oh yeah sorry yeah i don't want to ask any questions i just want to make the point that i think that this committee needs to revisit this report because where it says management comments as of 2022 was that december 2022 i.e less than three months ago was a much longer so rather than kind of going through it point by point at this stage i think that the committee in future should be part of its work plan to revisit this report with a more updated response from both management and uh, Grant Thornton. Point noted, Linda. Yeah, again, um, this is a very generic question for the whole, really. Um, Recognising that cyber risk is pretty much top of the tree for the council. Um, I guess it's a generic question to uh, Grant Thornton and to all officers. Um, how satisfied are we that the points that are being made in this report, whilst they re refer specifically to financial uh, systems, um, but I guess user access is, is a, um, a thing that will happen in systems that aren't financial as well. Um, how satisfied are we that the issues that are raised in this report from a financial perspective aren't replicated into the non-financial areas of the business um, whereby cyber risk could be as important if not more important uh, thanks chair thanks linda i think it's a really good question so i mean clearly our, our focus in this piece of work it, it are the sort of three financial uh, systems but you're right that that the issues there may, may be replicated in others. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that, Linda, um, but it's something I guess we can take away, obviously discuss with uh, with internal audit colleagues in terms of whether they've identified any significant issues in terms of access on non-financial systems and and see potentially how widespread that is elsewhere. But it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a good point. 
So if I can come in there. So um, that's where the actual uh, privileged user access work comes in. So obviously we're working uh, extensively with IDS colleagues. We have got a piece of work underway. We are doing a follow-up and we are also liaising with um, cyber colleagues as well in IDS to ensure that we, we are, um, are reviewing all these areas to make sure it's on the audit plan. So it is a work in progress. But coming back to the actual tracking of the recommendations and the follow-up within this report, um, I'd like to assure members that we are working with finance colleagues. Obviously, we track our own recommendations, but I'm already in discussions with Richard and his team to actually include these these recommendations in our own tracking. So um, it, it can really bring um, life to, to the um, recommendation tracking. And if members would like, we can actually include progress on these in the update reports in a, de in a special section. Um, I just said, I think that's a really good idea, Chair. Um, but the other point I wanted to come back in on was just to answer the uh, Council of Trustworth point. It, it was December 22 for the management responses, so relatively recent, um, just to clarify that. Thank you. Councillor Illingworth. <laughs> Chair, very quickly. Uh, you're talking about, obviously, the, the, the secret parts of the administration, but I wanted to look at the ordinary working practices, the uh, supplier is producing op opportunities for syncing different data sources for getting access to resources from far away um, and changes in working practices uh, and enhancements and stuff. Um, my question is, first of all, does the syncing arrangement introduce any security holes? Because it seems to be quite ambitious in, in what, what's being offered in Windows 11, for example. Uh, does it introduce any security holes? Uh, is there a need for additional trading courses for staff? Uh, and have the costs of that been, been sort of factored in? Because it seems to me that there is a case to be made that staff training, staff development is actually needed in this situation. So regarding training, um, I think you need to come back to management on that and, and, and so on. Uh, Regarding security holes, um, we're looking to really at the, the segregation of duties, that conflict of interest between people who can have got the privileged access versus people who can uh, do the financial operations. Um, the, the other part of that, I think I need to defer over to internal audit uh, as regards um, the work that they're doing on, on who can do what and why. Any other questions or comments? Okay, moving on to the recommendation then. Uh, members are asked to receive the annual uh, audits report and IT audit report presented by Grant Forton and to note the recommendations for improvement which have been made in each report. I'll take silence as acceptance. There we go. Uh, moving on then to, I think, the, the last main point of our agenda today, which is the Corporate Governance and Audit Committee Work Programme 2023-2024. Okay, so this report just sets out the proposed work programme for next year, so the dates of the meetings and the coverage there, along with the member development programme. Yeah, I'm going to present this on the assumption that everybody has read the report, and if there are any comments or suggestions, I'm happy to take those away, or likewise, if you want to come back to me outside of the meeting as well, uh, we can consider those. Uh, noting Council Truswell's point about the uh, previous report, which will work into there. Any other questions or comments on the work programme? Yeah, Council. Back to whistleblowing. Uh, I know that there's a, an item under every uh, every month's work programme on internal audit, but I'm not quite sure whether it falls under that or whether it falls under fraud, counter fraud, etc. That'll fall under the counter fraud updates. Only one. I think. It should be a biannual one, I believe. Uh, let me check. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, so the recommendations, we note that the, the work programme for 2023-2024 takes silence as a yes. 
Yes. So uh, that's the end of the meeting. The next meeting for those of us that are here will be on the uh, 26th of June 2023. And uh, I will see you all in the new meeting.